Okay, good morning. We are glad that you are here. And uh, today is going to be a little bit different because we're going to try to film the worship service live and then we'll post it sometime later. So uh, if, you may want to make sure you're not sitting in a spot where this will interfere with you with her getting up and down. Interesting day already. But you know what? God is good. And uh, so let's just go to him in prayer now. Father God, we do love you. We thank you, dear God, that we have an opportunity to come and to worship you. And dear God, even though things may not run as smoothly as we would like, you're still God. And what's important is our worship of you. So, dear God, we just thank you for this time. We pray, dear God, that uh, all that we say and do will bring you glory and honor. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. everything we have going on we have a lot of 
our own church family hurting right now. Um, this is a new song for us to be doing. Um, he, he's a way maker. That's what we got to look at. He's the one that's going to make a way for our church, for us during this time, and for us leading others to Christ during this time. Y'all help us out on singing this new song. Thank you, uh, Ron and Robin, for leading us in worship. Uh, this morning, before we start, I want to uh, remember several specifically in prayer. Uh, as you know, Archie Berrio, he's in the hospital, and it seemed like every day they say they're going to do the angioplasty the next day, and so now they're down to Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so keep Archie and Jane in your prayers. He's been in there for some time. Dave Hudson is uh, in uh, the hospital also, and so uh, most of you know about that, and uh, just keep them in your prayers as they are doing tests and trying to determine, uh, you know, what he needs. Is, is Dave in still in the hospital also? 
okay? Okay, so remember David Riggs? He's in the hospital also, and uh, the last text I had from him was last week. He said, I'm probably going home Saturday. Well, he didn't tell me which Saturday. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that are hurting and a lot of people that are struggling, and uh, we need to be thankful that we could be here today, amen? So we are thankful we are here, and let's lift up those in prayer uh, who couldn't be here. So let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father God, we do thank you for being our God, and a God who not only hears our prayers, but answers our prayers, a God who loves us and cares for us, a God who wants to experience all of our life with us, to walk with us in every situation. And we just thank you for being that God. And there are so many that are hurting and struggling. And we pray specifically today for Jane and Archie, for Barbara and Dave, uh, for Joy and David. I pray for them, dear God, for they are in the hospital and they really need... Uh, they really need you. They need your encouragement. They need you, dear God, to guide the situation, to uh, direct the doctors and nurses, to give them wisdom, because we know all true healing comes from you, dear God. And then there are so many who have lost their jobs and just are hurting from relationships. We pray that you'll be with them also. Be with our entire church, dear God. May we not lose focus on who you are. And may we continually serve you and worship you. Dear God, we just thank you for all the ways that you've blessed us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Turn with me, if you would, your copy of God's Word to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at just two verses today. And uh, we had several things planned today. Uh, but they didn't work out, so that's okay. We'll do them later. And uh, God is good. He knows what all is going to happen. His plans always come true. So we're going to look at these two verses today. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you will, read along with me with those two verses. Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you will prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, want to know what the will of God is? He gives us a hint here. We need to first conform, not to this world, but be transformed by him. When you come to this passage, as you know, we've been in a very difficult passage, part of Romans from chapters 9, 10, and 11. We finally make it back to 12. And, and actually, when Paul finished in verse uh, chapter 8, in the end, last verse, he's talking about how nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then the next thing, we could very easily jump to this passage. It's a very practical passage. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God. And he's, the, from 12 on through 15, he gives us some very practical advice on how to live out God's will for our life. Actually, this is the fourth therefore in the book of Romans. When it says, therefore, it is based on what has been said previous to that, based on what has been said, he says, therefore, here's what we, we should do. And what he has been saying up to this point, he's been really emphasizing that we're saved by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're justified by faith. We're made righteous with God through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 3.20 was the therefore of condemnation. In Romans 5, 1 was the therefore of justification. In Romans 8, 1 was the therefore of assurance, that we can have assurance that we know God and have a relationship with Him. But when we come to this section, Romans 12, 1 is the therefore of dedication. Therefore, because we have justification, 
therefore, because we have assurance, therefore, because of that, we should be dedicated and dedicate our life to the Lord. And so we need to be people who are dedicated. And Paul writes in many places we need to be people who are focused on living a life of the Lord, living a life that is worthy. In Ephesians 4.1, he says, As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Wow, that's, that's a pretty good challenge, isn't it? To live a life that's worthy of the calling that we receive. The calling of God on our life. Our calling to serve others. To love our enemies. All those things that Jesus tells us. That we need to live a life that is worthy of that. Do we not? Also, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So the Bible encourages us to live a life that is worthy of God. But my concern is I don't think people really think about that. I'm not sure Christians wake up on on Monday morning and think, how can I live today in a way that honors my God? How can I live a day today that is worthy? And we should. When we wake up in the morning, we should understand that we need to live in a way that causes non-believers to look at us and say, hey, boy, that must be a great God the way they're worshiping that God. That their actions are there. It's not just their talk, but their actions. They actually live in a way that is worthy of Him. I think uh, there's several things you can get out of this passage, these two verses. It's really packed full. But there's three things I want us to see that we need to look at on how do we live a life that is worthy of our Lord. How do we live a transformed life? How do we not be conformed to the world, but be transformed and live that life that honors our Lord? Number one, you give your body to God. You give your body to God. Look what he says here in verse, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, and it's only by God's mercy that we can do that. It's through his strengthening. It's through his Holy Spirit indwelling us and guiding us and teaching us. And as we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading, living that life, it's only by God. It's not by our abilities. It's, it's him guiding us. It's his mercies. But look what he says. To present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You see, before we trusted Christ, we used our bodies in a sinful way. Before we trusted Christ, we chased those sinful pleasures in our Our body was devoted just to our selfishness and what we wanted in the flesh. But here he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Interesting here, just a a quick note, when he talks about a living and sacrifice, he's talking about living and dead, right? A sacrifice is something that you kill, that, that you offered up on the altar. As Abraham was going to offer up Isaac as that sacrifice, he was willing to kill him, of course, Romans tells us, Paul interprets it because he knew that God would raise him back up. What a great faith that is. His only son he trusted God with. But here he says we should live in a way that we are dead to the things of the world, that we are sacrificing those things to the world. You see, our our body, the Bible tells us, is a temple. Our body is a temple. Regardless what the world will tell you, not getting political here, not meaning to, but when you're talking about a woman has a right to do anything to her body, she wishes, well, I would say, well, you may have that right, but not to take someone else's life. You need to exercise your right and live a holy life and you won't be in that situation. 
The world tells us, if it feels good, do it. I mean, even Nike, man, I mean, that was one of their biggest marketing things. If it feels good, do it. Our bodies for Christians shouldn't be about our own pleasure and our own needs. But it should be about serving God and worshiping Him. Think about all the ways we use our body in a way that dishonors our Lord. When you think about it, I mean, the list can run on forever and ever. Drugs, you're using drugs just to get some kind of quick high, but it will destroy your body. That does not bring honor to the Lord. I know you've seen those pictures of people who they have the before and after, before they were on drugs and then after, and only maybe a few years passed, and it looks like they aged 100 years. Drugs would do it. Alcohol would do it. You know, the... Uh, What's the seventh commandment? Somebody shout it out. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It has to do with being faithful, true, but it has to do with using your body in the wrong way. See, so many people, and and young people, I I want you to understand this. Don't just give your body away. Your body belongs to the Lord. And there's so many people who just want to give their body away to whoever comes along because they think it's their body. Paul here says that we need to use our bodies in a way that brings him honor and we bring him glory. You know, one of the struggles that that I have on on dealing with uh, just in ministry in general, listen, you can... uh, I don't have to be the, I'm not the Holy Spirit to tell you everything is right or wrong. Now, if you're, if you're out there committing adultery, I'm going to tell you that's wrong. If you're out there sinning, doing drugs, I'm going to tell you that's wrong. Just because it's, that's real easy. I, I can get that out of God's Word. It's not me to pass judgment on you, and I'm not passing judgment. I'm just simply saying there's certain ways you can live your life that honors the Lord, and there's ways you can live your life and use your body that does not honor the Lord. Where my struggles are is sometimes people want to use their bodies or they want to participate in things. And if you want to do it, I mean, that's your choice. That's between you and God. But then they get mad at me when I can't participate in them with them. They may want to invite me to something, and I'm going, you know, I can't go to that. Thanks for the invite. I really do appreciate it, and I do, because it's very kind of you to think of me. But I feel like that would be wrong for me to attend, wrong for me to participate in. And this really has nothing to do with with the individual who's inviting me. It has to do with me honoring my Lord. This is between me and God. This is something we need to work out. We just need to be careful that we don't use our bodies in a way that dishonor Him. The Bible tells us our body is a temple. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Romans 8, 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. You are a temple, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. And so we need to live a life that honors the Lord. In Philippians 1, 20 through 21, he says, According to my earnest expectations and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ, to die is to gain. So our body is a temple. 
And we need to live a life. The, the words that come out of it needs to honor the Lord. The way we use our body, what we participate in, should honor our Lord. There are so many ways that we dishonor him with our bodies. Things we say, places we go, things we participate in. Think about all the ways you can use your body to honor the Lord. The things you say, you can voice about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he's a God of forgiveness, a God of love, and a God of grace. About the places you go, you know, writer of Hebrews says, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. So many times people, I think, dishonor the Lord simply by deciding, well, do I really want to go to church today or do I want to go play golf or do I want to go fishing or do I just want to sleep in, do I just want to take a day off? What do I want to do? And so many people come to church just because they have nothing else to do. That doesn't bring God honor. So Paul here is saying, man, he says, he says, therefore, based on all these things that we have said, on how great God is, and how God's promises are always there, that assurance we know that our God is always for us, based on that, honor the God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. The Bible always talks about our, our body being a tent. Not only a temple, but it talks about it being a tent. Let me read this to you. If you want to turn to it, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. He says, starting verse 1, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked, for indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. And the NIV adds at that point, clothed with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk not by faith, uh, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home, and again the NIV adds, in the body, or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must always appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed, that is, receive what is due him, as the NIV says, for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Again, our body is a temple. By, when we look in the Bible, our, God, our body is a tent. It's just a dwelling. It's just something we use that God gave us that we need, but we can use it for his glory or not. And so when I'm thinking about that, and when I was studying this, I actually thought, okay, so our body is a tool. Our body's a tool. Our bodies are a tool for God to use, hopefully for God to use if we submit our life to him. Well, think about this. Or it's a tool for Satan to use to bring discredit upon our Lord. But the way we use our body, if we look at our body simply as a tool, something that God gave us that we use to honor Him. In Romans 6, 12 through 14, 
He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under the law, but you are under grace. So our bodies is a tool. That's all it is. And the world looks at us as our body is who I am. Our body is what I want it to be. My body, I can do anything I wish to with my body. Because the world looks at the body just simply that brings me pleasure. So I can go chase anything I want to chase. It doesn't matter. That's not what God's Word says. God's Word says that our, our body is a temple. Our body is a tent. It's a place the Holy Spirit dwells. Our body is a tool that we use to either honor God or to dishonor Him. In Galatians 2.20, uh, Paul reminds us we need to dedicate our bodies to the Lord. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, what does that mean? He's talking about the physical body. He's using this metaphor that he's been crucified. In other words, it's like his body's been put to death. When Jesus was crucified, his body died on the cross. They crucified him. They tried to kill his body. Okay? So Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, and the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, how do you use your body? Do you use it to glorify God? Do you use it to serve God? Is it a tool for God to use? Or are you using it only for selfish pleasures, sinful pleasures? Or are you bringing dishonor to the Lord with your body? Now look, we've all made mistakes, right? We have all fallen in certain areas and we've all done things we wish we had not done. And I want you to know that God forgives you for every one of those. And if you really appreciate God forgiving you for all that you have done, based on what God has done, Paul would say, therefore, Therefore, from now on, because of what God has done, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice to the Lord. We worship God through our bodies, through how we act and what we do. And young people, and this is for everybody, but young people especially, listen, when someone tries to ridicule you or something because you won't participate in something, Hey, that's just Satan talking. You bring God a lot of honor when you say, no, I'm walking away from that because that does not bring my God honor. And my body is a tool and it's devoted to the Lord. You know, we need to live in a way that our life represents our faith. Do we not? And that's what Paul is talking about here. So he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. The second thing in this is not just the body, but he says, give your mind to God also. Number two is give your mind to God. Look what he says in verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, it starts in the mind. Listen, when I was a youth minister, uh, I used to tell my teenagers, uh, we talked very bluntly about some topics and I said listen you need to make up in your mind how you're going to act in certain situations and I told them I said I promise you if you're waiting till you're in the back seat of that car to try to figure out what's right or wrong you're going to make a mistake it's not going to happen you need to make up your mind right now. When I'm in a certain situation, how am I going to act? And what am I going to do? While you're thinking clearly, you need to make that mind up. 
Of course, that applies to all of us, does it not? You know, for me, that, that's, that is really, really true. And I've shared this with you before. I have to be very careful sometimes because uh, uh, I believe in clear communication, and sometimes I'm a little too clear, <laughs> a little too blunt, maybe, and people might misinterpret it. Uh, but if I know a situation is going to happen, and it could be a bad situation, and, and things could get heated, if I know those things in advance, I can prepare myself. And I know, okay, when this happens, here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to escalate it. I'm going to respond like this. And if this person gets mad, then I'm going to forgive them. I can't wait to the heat of the moment because I'm going to be mad because they said that and I'm going to say this. So it's true for all of us in all situations. We need to prepare our mind. We need to give our mind over to God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, talking about the deception of the mind. He says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You remember what happened that, <clears throat> that Satan in the Garden of Eden tricked Eve and, and tricked her mind and led her away? And when you hear he talks about the simplicity and purity of the devotion to Christ, it, it is real simple. Don't do anything that might dishonor the Lord. Focus upon Him and what would Jesus want to do. Realize this, if you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit indwells you, literally, I believe, indwells you, and will convict you in certain spots. If you'll depend on Him, He will tell you, hey, you need to get out of this situation. You need to leave here. You need to be away from this. But we can not wait to be deceived by our mind, by Satan, but we can devote our mind to the Lord. And, you know, the mind is a battlefield, is it not? It's a battlefield. And I don't know why, and I've shared this before, why can I be just driving along on a, pure, a beautiful afternoon, you know, and pretty day, and all of a sudden I get this bad thought, I go, ooh, where would that come from? <laughs> why did that just, how can that just come in with something, you see something, and it sparks something, and I don't know, and you get this bad thought, and... And what I do for me, I, you have to decide what works for you, but what I do, and, and thank goodness nobody's in the car with me, but I sing praise songs. I sing praise songs and I worship God because that helps me block those bad things out. It pushes those bad things out of my mind and it fills me, fills my mind with the things of God. So a lot of times I just, oh man, I just start singing praise songs. It's kind of like if I can't sleep at night. I go, okay, God, you must have me up for a reason. So I spend a lot of time in prayer. You know, there's things we can do. We need to control our mind. Uh, it's a battlefield. In Romans 8, 5 and 8, it reminds us of that. He says, for those who are, and the NIV says live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So what's he trying to say there? That, that our mind's a battlefield. And if we're using our mind just to focus on those things of the flesh, you can't please God doing that. You need to fill it with the things of the Spirit. In Ephesians 4, 22 and 24, you notice i got a lot of verses on all these today. Everything i got is just verses. The Bible says so much about our bodies and our mind and devoting them to God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24 says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness in the truth. So we need to put on the mind of God. We should have the same mind that our Lord Jesus has. It should be a mind that's focused on Him. 
So it's not just uh, our bodies. We need to give our bodies to God. We need to give our mind to God. We need to give our will to God. Number three, we need to give our will to God. It's about who we are and the things we want. It's our will. We need to focus on the things of God. Because he goes on, he says there in, in verse 2, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And, and let me tell you, only God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. The human will is not. And we need to conform to God's will. If someone looks at us and how we use our body and, and the way we think in our mind, what do they think about God based on that? If they were to evaluate us and say, oh, well, this person does this and they're always saying this and they're always doing this, what does that say about who God is? We need to always remember. We need to we need to have God's will. We need to live out his will in our life. Romans 15, 15 through 17, and we'll be there in a few weeks. He says, but I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest, the gospel of God, so that my offering to the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. You see, what he's trying to say there that is, is that, hey, I, Paul for himself, I'm a minister. I'm a minister. I use my body to preach to the Gentiles. And so he does it because this is what he offers his praise to God. And he boasts about what God is doing in his life. Now listen, there's a difference in boasting about what you have done and boasting about what God has done. And I'll be honest, God keeps me humble there because there's not very much I can even think about boasting about what I've done. But let me tell you what God has done. God gave hope where there was no hope. God gave healing where there was hurting. God gave salvation, eternal life, where there was only death and destruction ahead. God reached down and forgave me. And God showed his grace and mercy upon me. The question is, how does that affect my life? Paul, it changed him because he is now taking that gospel out to a group that he used to persecute. And now he's carrying that message of Jesus Christ out. You know, Paul, if you do a, a study on Paul, all the times he has been beaten, all the times he has been shipwrecked, all the times he has been put into jail, all those times his close friends and people he grew up with turned against him. But yet Paul will write for me to live as Christ. And to die, that's even better. That's even gain. Why? Because his will matched God's will. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. But folks, may we be able to say that same thing. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Not that I am living a life that does not bring God honor and glory. But he's living a life that brings God grace. So he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove in vain. Now, I hope and pray that God's grace toward me, when it comes to the end of my life, was not in vain that I served him with all that I had because he's worthy of our service. Paul says, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. See, Paul acknowledged, he said, man, I worked and I worked and I worked hard, 
But that really wasn't me. That was God through me because he was willing to submit to God. He gave his body to God, his mind to God, and his will to God. And in Ephesians 5, 15, and 17, he just simply says, Therefore, listen to this, folks. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Of course, that means live, right? Be careful how you walk or live. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You want to know what the will of God is for your life? I have a lot of times you hear people, man, I just wish I knew what the will of God is for my life. Here's something you can tell them. Let me tell you what the will of God is for your life. To give your body to God, to give your mind to God, and to give your will to God. That's, wills, that's God's will for your life. It's that you live a life that honors him. I live a life that brings him honor and glory. A life that is worthy, not a life in vain. May we be a church that walk and talk and do and act in a way that honors our Lord. Amen? And the only way we can do it is through the grace of God. But God guarantees you that you can do it if you'll just simply depend upon him. I pray that today, that we leave here today, every one of us, more devoted to our Lord. May we leave today understanding that our body belongs to him, our mind belongs to him, and our will belongs to him. Let us pray. Father God, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you, dear God, that you allow us to come and to study it, and you remind us and teach us, dear God, that everything we have, our body and our mind, even those belong to you. Help us, dear God, to use them in a way that honors you. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us. Of course, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning, as we're going to take up our offering, and the way we do that is when you leave, you just simply put it in the plate out the door. But as always, we want to remember our missionaries who are serving in other parts of the world. Today, we're remembering Brian and Mandy Davis, and they are serving in Bulgaria. And that's a country in Eastern Europe, and it was part of the uh, Soviet Union. And so we just pray that, that lift them up today, that they'll be encouraged and they'll be safe, and they'll be able to do all the things that, that God wants them to do. And I, you know, the thing is, they will be able to do everything God wants them to do. Okay. Tomorrow, you can do everything God wants you to do tomorrow. You know why? God only asked you to do what you can do. There's 24 hours in a day, and we can serve God in every one of those hours. Tomorrow, we can live a life worthy. Amen? I pray we start out this week living a life worthy of our Lord. Let's stand and we'll pray as we're dismissed. Father God, we do thank you so much for being our God. And wow, all the blessings, even though we have been unfaithful, even though we have acted in a way that did not honor you, you still loved us. And you were patient with us. And you still drew us to you. And even though we had sinned, you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Wow, you are such an awesome God. And you deserve to be, to be treated with honor and glory. And so dear God, as we go out this week and we're praying for all the missionaries that are serving you so selfishly, we pray dear God that we too will be devoted to you. And all that we do this week will bring you honor and glory. Help us, dear God, to honor you with all that we have, all that you've given us. May you receive honor. Verse in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
his mercy. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. is who you are.